Yeah. Mr. Black, when are you going to apologize for the million Iraqis that are dead because you lied? You lied about weapons of mass destruction. You lied about connections to 9 11. You lied about Iraq being a threat. You sent me to Iraq. You sent me to Iraq in 2003. My friends are dead. Joshua Castile. You, you killed people. You lied. You lied about WMDs. A million Iraqis are dead because you lied. My friends are dead because you lied. You need to apologize. Apologize. You need to apologize. 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 Are you with this gentleman? No. What just happened? Uh, I'm wondering if they're going to arrest me, but I just disrupted George Bush speaking. Um, they dragged me out. Uh, uh, I guess the cops are not after me, so I, I guess I'm not arrested. Running, but yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, well, what I did was I tried to read the names of friends of mine who uh, died after going to Iraq and then uh, died of um, injuries they came home with, um, the names of Iraqis who were killed by the U.S. occupation in the Nisor Square massacre, Aditha, those you saw in the collateral murder video. Um, I tried to read the names, but the event runners immediately grabbed the list and tore it up. Uh, but I was able to shut it down for a little while, right when Bush was getting into his first little cheesy story about um, his life and all that, trying to be funny. But uh, so hopefully I shook him and set a tone for the event. The crowd was very mad. Um, typical crowd you would expect for George W. Bush, but they seem to not be expecting it at all. And um, here we are. So I uh, tried not to give them a little moment of peace because no one else gets it who is touched by the war. That was a Rock War veteran and Empire Files producer, Mike Preisner, doing what I think is absolutely courageous and commendable, confronting war criminal George W. Bush at a speech that he was giving in Beverly Hills. Now, there is so much about that clip that... I hated. I mean, I loved that Mike uh, decided to confront him, but the fact that people showed up to listen to George W. Bush in the first place irritates me, but they literally booed when Mike Preisner called out the WMD lie that led to a million Iraqi deaths. They booed him. I mean, maybe you want to hear George W. Bush speak because he's a former president, but you know about the fact that he's a war criminal. Well, it seems like they don't actually really care. They they literally booed him when he called out this lie that led to a million deaths. Like, every single person in that room has got to be a sociopath. Like, I'm just going to assume that they're all bad people and shitty people to even want to hear George W. Bush. But the fact that some people would boo Mike Preisner, I mean, that's just, that's, that's gross. I don't know what else to say about that. That's just, that's disgusting. Fuck those people. Fuck every single person who was there who unironically wanted to hear George W. Bush speak. Now, getting to George W. Bush himself, who should be riding in a jail cell for the rest of his life, he literally laughed off what Mike Preisner said. Did you hear it? So I don't know that I have the exact thing that he said, but he did say something about behaving yourself, and I listened to this again and again and again, and this is what it sounded like he was saying to Mike Preisner. Senator Kerry, you said you'd behave yourself. He was saying this to Mike Preisner. So basically, he was cracking a joke about the fact that in the 2004 presidential election, when he was running against John Kerry, John Kerry called him out for the lie, the WMD lie that led to the Iraq war that was the basis for the invasion of Iraq. And John Kerry is no saint. He voted for the Iraq war himself, which I think is just unforgivable. But He's basically trying to joke about the fact that, oh, well, this is a tired conversation. Mike, what you're saying is the same thing I heard in 2004 from John Kerry. Like, you said you'd behave yourself, Senator Kerry. I think that's what he said. But either way, even the hint that this person who's confronting a war criminal should behave themselves. No, you should behave yourself. Go fuck yourself, George Bush. You killed a million people. You lied. And that lie led to a million deaths and he's not remorseful at all like we didn't see the look on his face but clearly he didn't care he was unmoved because he was laughing as somebody called out the lies i mean you had to have heard mike say that he was there his friends died a million iraqis died 
but George Bush literally couldn't care less. And this isn't the first time that he's joked about this. When he was still president, he literally joked about not being able to find WMDs. I'm not kidding about this. Take a look. <laughs> Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> Nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. <laughs> yeah, so he has no remorse whatsoever. He doesn't care about the fact that he has blood on his hands. He does not care. And yet we have the media parading him around, rehabilitating his image as if he's some sort of moral authority on what is and isn't good policy in the United States. Why are we listening to him again? It's literally just because the GOP has gotten so demonstrably insane that when you look at someone like George W. Bush, who isn't necessarily frothing at the mouth, but is more insidious in the threat that he poses and more, um, you know, more <sighs> respectable in the bad things that he does, since he's kind of like this antithesis to Trump and since he's anti-Trump, the media thinks, oh, well, great, we should parade George W. Bush around. And that really, it speaks to the moral bankruptcy of the ruling class in the United States, the political elites, media elites in the United States. Because to rehabilitate somebody who is a mass murderer, I just... I don't know what to say about that. Now, to give you some additional details, this is what Mike Preisner tweeted out. Almost 20 years after he sent me to Iraq, I disrupted George W. Bush's speech tonight. I tried to read a list of names, mostly of Iraqis killed, as well as my friends who became anti-war activists after Iraq, who then died of suicide or other war wounds. They ripped up my list. Also on my list of names, the victims in the collateral murder video, the Nassar Square massacre, as well as U.S. troops killed in Iraq, whose parents then formed the powerful anti-war organization gold star families for peace bush should never know peace for the lives he destroyed couldn't have done this without my comrade marissa who helped sneak us in and filmed we assumed we'd both be arrested and our crew answer coalition holding a protest outside and running our support logistics we are not yet in the clear legally just learned the event organizers were irate that the police did not arrest us so every single event where george w bush speaks or is invited to that event should be shut down he should fear ever showing his disgusting face in public because this man is a sociopathic mass murderer. And the fact that he has his freedom after he took so many lives, but yet Mike Preisner has to fear that he's going to be arrested because he confronted this mass murderer. Like, it shows how fucked up and ass-backwards our society is. Now, for those of you who are unaware of how Mike Preisner kind of, like, came to this current status where he's been radicalized. He's this anti-war activist. Well, it was because of his experience in Iraq. Now, this is about 10 years old, but this clip, it kind of gives us some insight into the things that he shares about like what he had to do when he was serving in Iraq, and it's truly gut-wrenching. Take a look. And we've heard a lot about different raids and kicking down the doors of people's houses and, and ransacking their houses. But this mission was, was different, a different kind of raid. Uh, I never got any explanation for these orders. We were only told that this, this group of houses, five or six houses, uh, were now property of the U.S. military, and we had to go in and make those families leave those houses. So we went to these houses and informed the families that those homes were no longer their homes. Uh, we provided them no alternative, nowhere to go, no compensation, uh, and they are very confused and very scared. and, and did not know what to do and would not leave, so we had to remove them from those houses. Uh, one family in particular, a woman with two small girls, a very elderly man and, and two middle-aged men, um, we, we dragged them from their houses and, and threw them onto the street and arrested the men because they refused to leave, uh, arrested the old man and sent them off to prison. And at that time, I, I didn't know what happened to people when we, we tied their hands behind their back and, and put a sandbag on their head. But uh, unfortunately, a, a few months later, I, I, I had to find out. I was, we were short interrogators, so I was assigned to, to work as an interrogator. And uh, 
I oversaw it and participated in uh, hundreds of, of interrogations. One in particular I'm going to share with you is it was, it was a, a moment for me that, that, that really showed me the, the nature of, of this occupation. Um, this, this particular uh, detainee, um, when I was uh, sent to interrogate him, he was stripped down to his underwear, um, hands behind his back and, and sandbag on his head. Uh, I never actually saw this man's face. Um, my job was to take this metal folding chair and just smash it against the wall next to his head. He was, he was faced against the wall with his nose touching the wall. While a fellow soldier screamed the same question over and over again, no matter what his answer, my job was to slam the chair against his wall. Um, we did this until basically we got tired. And I was told to make sure he stood against the wall uh, for however long. And I was guarding this prisoner. And my job was to make sure he kept standing up. But something was wrong with his leg. He was, he was injured. And he kept like, stuck, like falling to the ground. Uh, and my, the sergeant in charge would, would come and, and tell me to, to get him up off his feet. So we'd, I'd have to pick him up and put him against the wall. And oh, he kept going down. I just have to keep pulling him up and putting him against the wall. And my sergeant came along, and, and he was upset with me for not you know, continue to stand. Uh, he picked him up and, and slammed him against the wall several times. Um, and then he left. and, and when the man went down on the ground again, I noticed blood pouring down from under the sandbag. Uh, and so I let him sit. And when I noticed my sergeant coming again, I would tell him that quickly to stand up. And then I realized that I was supposed to be guarding my unit from this detainee. And at that point, I realized I was guarding the detainee from my unit. And I tried hard to be proud of my service, but all I could feel was shame. And racism could no longer mask the reality of the occupation. These were people. These were human beings. I've since been plagued by guilt any time I see an elderly man, like the one who couldn't walk, who he rolled onto his stretcher and told the Iraqi police to take him away. I feel guilt any time I see a mother with her children, like the one who cried hysterically and screamed that we are worse than Saddam as we forced her from her home. I feel guilt any time I see a young girl, like the one I grab by the arm and drag into the street. We were told we were fighting terrorists. The real terrorist was me, and the real terrorism is this occupation. That is why he is a staunch anti-war veteran. I've seen this speech before, but every single time I watch it, it really gets to me because the things that happened there, like you, you hear the emotion and the pain and the regret in Mike's voice, but when you hear George W. Bush, like contrast that with him, and there's nothing. No regret whatsoever, no uh, feeling of remorse for all of the lives that he took, no feeling of um, guilt whatsoever. So what kind of a weird world is it that we live in to where an Iraq war veteran who is trying to shed light on the atrocities that we were committing, this person is going to go to jail possibly because he confronted this mass murderer, but the mass murderer gets to speak. The mass murderer gets to be paraded around as if he's some sort of a hero. The mass murderer has thousands of people who still want to hear what he has to say when nobody should be listening to what he has to say. It's just, it, it's truly gross. And really, this is one of the things that really made me lose faith in America. I mean, there was never really this time where I, I felt like the United States government respected human rights. But the blatant disregard for the suffering that we caused in Iraq and the refusal to hold the war criminals that caused this atrocity responsible and the fact that we're parading them around as some sort of fucking heroes, that really, it just, like, it shows how morally bankrupt we are as a society. Like, it shows that we don't give a shit about human rights. The fact that there aren't more calls for him to be jailed, the fact that he's still getting invited to events... I don't care who you are, if you're a former president, if you're God, to do that much, to kill that many people, you should be barred from participating in society. You should be worried that people are going to throw tomatoes at you every single time you show your disgusting face in public. But the fact that he is still 
propped up as some sort of a hero is it, truly gross. So I absolutely have the utmost respect for Mike Preisner for doing what needs to be done, confronting this war criminal, calling him out, and reminding people about all the pain and suffering that he caused. It's just, I, there, there's no words for it. This is a monster. And the fact that there's never going to be justice for his victims, the fact that they'll never know that the person who terrorized them is going to be behind bars, it's really depressing to think about.